Oh, wow. Excellent. Very, very exciting. So I think that we are about to hit screens across the world. Welcome to everybody. Welcome to hopefully the world of YouTube who are tuning in live to this very special event which is put together by Omnibus Books. Hello to Omnibus Books, and thank you very much for asking me. Joe Kendall, I'm a music journalist. I write for Prog Magazine, Classic Rock, and Record Collector and Electronic Sound. And I am so chuffed to have been asked to helm this event in conversation with the most fantastic uh, Tony Fletcher. Hello, Tony. Good to Hello, see you. Hello, Joe. <laughs> Greetings from across the oceans. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm looking around you because your room looks so impressive. It's the Rock Lounge. It's done especially <laughs> for today. It changes from time to time, but we are Who themed, we are Keith Moon themed. We are talking about your fantastic, we, were we are commemorating 45 years since Keith Moon passed, which was yesterday. And we are commemorating 25 years of your amazing biography, which came out, which is Dear Boy, uh, The Life of Keith Moon, of course. So, um, in this commemoration period, you kicked off something last night on the actual day of Keith's passing. This is in New York where you live. So tell us a little bit yeah, about it. It is. It's in New York State. I live um, a little bit upstate now, close to the entrance to the Catskill Mountains. And uh, there's a cinema nearby that uh, that does a lot of events and being, being a sort of artistic area. And uh, the owner there had asked me in to do something six months ago, or I mentioned he originally asked me best part of a year ago. We did an REM event. Um, we did an REM event, and it was a really big success. Forty years after Murmur came out, and he is very the the owner there is very much about having uh, an event commemorated on the day of. So we did something from uh, we did something yesterday to commemorate uh, Keith's life. It really was like Keith Keith Moon a celebration, and it was really, really, really well attended. I'm glad to say. I mean, Saugerties is a pretty small town, and people people drive, and a couple of people drove up from almost New York City for it. And I rabbited on for an hour and a half, but we did have a drummer um, from the Rock Academy where I work, the the, the guy who co-founded the Rock Academy, uh, right here where I work, and he. Um, he held a little drum clinic to actually show what it is that Keith does, and that was pretty fascinating. That's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, well, not sat about at the drums, and we show, I showed him three. I showed the audience three clips, and uh, he was like breaking down. So what Keith is doing is he's hitting this, then he's hitting this, and and then he just like got it perfectly. So that was really cool. We don't have that today. You're just stuck with me. <laughs> Hang on. But we I've thought got... all along it would be great, you know, to do something with um, Omnibus because Omnibus, you know, actually published the book 45 years ago. It came out in the States a bit later. And without uh, Chris Charlesworth at Omnibus, uh, this book would it, it would not really have happened. And I know it, was a, it always has been a really, really big deal for the publishers. This book did exceptionally well in the UK. It did very well in the USA, but it did exceptionally well in the UK. So. We just thought as people are settling into their weekends, we would uh, test the world of live streaming. And here we are. Yeah, yeah. And if anybody out there is drumming along to Keith Moon, let us know, because we have got a moderator. We've got lovely Greg, who's in the uh, back room working really hard. We've got uh, comments going on. I will be able to ask your questions for you to Tony. So if you've got a burning question, let Greg know. He's going to get get that on chat for us. And we'll be doing that at the end of this conversation here. But uh, let's just start at the beginning then. So Tony, obviously a Who fan. How did that start? Oh, oh yes, very, very much so. I can I I don't believe it's a fake memory. I remember hearing Join Together when I would have been just eight years old and it sounded pretty otherworldly to me with the synthesizers, but it was probably only I mean only a year or two later after my initial sort of love of glam yeah, the glam sweet and slade and all of that that uh, I got introduced to Meaty Beaty Big and Bouncy and uh, one of the great compilations of, of all times and uh, okay. just played it to death for a long time at the age of 10 or 11. I was off seeing The Who at Charlton in 1976, Keith Moon's last show in, the, in, in England. Um, when I was age 12 in 76, I uh, went, actually went on my own, which just so that yeah, I wrote about that in Boy About Town. But the more I think about it, the more remarkable that seems. That's insane. <laughs> 
you know, there's, there's, we were latchkey kids in a big, big, big way. Um, the idea that anybody would do let, let their kid do something like that now, where I live, is just so remote. But yeah, just the biggest Who fan, and and I still am with the early ish music by which i really mean up until keith's death i actually listened to who by numbers yesterday very underrated album from you know keith's penultimate album Absolutely. so yeah i'm just i i remain a massive who fan in terms of that period that that sort of 12 year period when keith was recording and playing with the who so was keith the band member that actually stood out to you now, in some ways, I mean, I'm not actually a drummer. I'm a guitarist. So Pete, Pete Townsend is kind of, you know, we're not meant to have heroes. We're not meant to have idols. And there is an aspect to this uh, with, with regard to Keith's less, less savory aspects where, as I said last night, you know, there is the danger. It's not so much don't meet your heroes because I met Keith and he was wonderful, but maybe don't write books about them. Because if you, if you want to go in deep, you, you will find out stuff that you maybe were better off not knowing. Um, but Pete, Pete is as close as it gets for me to have an idol. I think Pete is genius in his own way. And um, I emulate him as a guitarist because I love that he's not a lead guitarist and as a songwriter. And in fact, I love his singing as well within The Who. But Keith was, uh, for any of us who were around when he was alive, he was living life so it seemed, and I have to put that caveat in, the way we thought we wished we could have lived our lives. And I became aware with writing the book, and actually Pete is on the record of saying something about this, that we and other people raised this particular word. We as an audience have had a habit of living vicariously through our, our, our heroes and idols, and a lot of us and I'm, I was only 14 when Keith died, but in my own tiny, tiny way, you know, idolizing somebody who was, who was living the way he lived and thinking it was so cool without actually knowing anything about what he was going through. Um, it only kind of, you know, when, when you, me individually makes no difference, but if there's a hundred thousand of me or maybe a million of me buying Who records, we are ultimately enabling and endorsing him to behave in a way that he was no longer enjoying. And so, you know, we were living vicariously through him. But I just got to say, leaving that aside, when I wrote the book, I was determined my goal was to write about Keith, the drummer, the musician, and to put him in his deserved place in the pantheon of rock drummers, which is number one. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, we can argue about that and probably people out there will, will do other people will, will do that but we'll talk a bit more about his um uh, musical um uh, prowess a bit later just again sort of like getting into how this book came back because like did you do two books and then you went right i'm going to do keith moon <laughs> Is yeah. That what it is? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. I did. I did a, a couple of books for Omnibus with Chris Charlesworth. I did the Echo and the Bunnymen book, which was still actually the easiest process I ever had, even though I was actually working with the band. I think when you're really, really young, it's, I don't know, so things are oddly easier. It's the only time I've had to run a book like by a band and they just read it and went, yeah, cool. Um, and then I then I did a book on REM, which has subsequently been updated many, many a time. So there's many itinerations of it, but there is now one big thick version that I'm very, very proud of. It's, it's finally the book I wanted it to be all along, really. Um, and the groups, I don't expect them to reform. So I think that is the final word. And um, I had, uh, was, was doing other things. I was doing journalism, but I was also involved in, um, I'd gotten, found myself I'd oddly DJing at the limelight and had a partner and we were doing good stuff there and I was uh, going to be getting married. And I also felt I needed to sort of stop doing the limelight situation. And this idea of writing about Keith had been on my mind for a long time. And I think a lot of it is to do with the fact that I met him right before he died. And it's in the book, it's at the back of the book, and a lot of people will have read that. And because he was so kind and nice to me, I, I, every time I read something about Moon the Loon and, and his destructive behavior, I thought, well, that was clearly there, but this guy was really nice to me. And if he was nice to me, he was nice to other people. And I bet you there is also a story here about a conflicted character 
And I also just think probably he was not as happy as he made himself out to be. And I wonder if I am capable of going down this path. And I probably kicked it around in, in my head for, for years, maybe since before I even wrote a book, uh, wondering if I could be that person. And to jump from a sort of 60,000 word book on REM that was the initial edition was probably only, I don't know, maybe 150 pages. To that. To that. So that, which even on initial <laughs> publication before the afterward was about 550, uh, it was an, an enormous leap. And I don't believe particularly in, uh, it's funny, I was listening to a podcast where uh, it was just an interview like this, but they got into asking, you know, what are the mathematical chances of, of this happening? And is the universe sending out energy? And I don't know the answer to that, but I think that I was the right person to take on writing about Keith. You know, ultimately, ultimately, I don't remotely think that was meant to be my life's work, but I think it was something I was meant to be doing. Well, Tony, you definitely put your back into it. <laughs> you did so, so much research. I don't know how long it would have taken for you to do this. You'll fill us in. But, you know, of course, the subject's no longer with us. So how do you tell the story? And you just went for the bigger picture. All of those people that you had to interview must have snowballed. Did you start to think, oh, my God, what am I getting into? Or, you know, how, you know, how long did it take and how many people did you did you end up talking to? Yeah, what I decided to do, I think I got the deal in late 95 and started right when my older son was born. I mean, it was and it was all pretty precarious because uh, the, I say I got the deal. It's important to say, you know, there's a UK and a US publisher and it, it worked out really well because the US publisher actually put in enough money to help me put in the time at my end, which I couldn't have done. God bless all of you at Omnibus, but not on the advances that were coming out back then. I just wouldn't have been able to do it. I was also in a fortunate position that it was the 90s, the music business was awash with money, and I had a um, a, a ridiculous like A&R consultancy gig with RCA Records. And when it came to researching the book, I was able to talk them into letting me live in the UK for six months and carry on doing the work. Wouldn't cost them any different. And so I actually came over to the UK for six months, which was additionally good just because we had a baby and he could be a, my mum was there and we could take advantage. I made the decision early on at the beginning that uh, I was going to talk to anybody and everybody that said they had ever had anything to do with Keith Moon. Now, I realize, yeah, you're wow. laughing, but you <laughs> okay. realize after a while, that was half the music world, probably about half the acting world, and most of the people at most pubs across the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Not to me, yeah, and, not to me, yeah. and Tony, without the internet as well, you had to... Yeah, without the internet. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it's, uh, it's great. I was talking about some of this last night because I was showing videos. I said, there was no YouTube. For me, you know, some of these things I never saw, and a lot of them that I did see, I would have to wait for somebody to send me a tape. And um, I, I actually don't mind that it wasn't the internet. I think that in a way, when you called somebody, it's unnerving when you're calling someone famous. Uh, it is unnerving. It's really unnerving. But the chances are they're going to ignore your email. But if there's somebody who picks up the phone, at least you've got 20 seconds to make an impression. And... There's only one, I can only think of one person who told me to, to get lost. And um, he's no longer with us, so I don't mind saying who, who it is. It was Leslie name West. <laughs> Les, it oh, was Leslie West. West, and I didn't yeah. quite understand that. I got given his number. I got given lots of people's numbers. Um, there were a couple of people who weren't initially thrilled at the idea, but they came around. And there was a lot of sticking letters in the mail. We, oh. did, have, we did have email, but... My memory is that for the first half of doing this book, Omnibus did not have email. Like, like Omnibus came online halfway through the process. Um, and the other thing about doing the work, because people have often said, oh, my God, how long did that take you to write? I think it depends what you put into it in terms of time. And when it came time to write the book, I did something that was uh, – you know, arguably not wise financially, but I think it, it did pay off. And I just uh, stopped all other work, like literally stopped doing writing for Newsday, um, ended doing the work with RCA 
um, and just sat down and wrote the book. And for nine, 10 months, pretty solid. I would get up in the morning, write, have dinner, you know, play with the baby who is now an infant, go back to my room, carry on writing and go to bed with, you know, Keith Moon running around inside my head. Wow. Single tasking. There's something to be said for that, you know, <laughs> even yeah, if it was there, like there, nine there or ten is, months. And it's, 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 kind it's of the length of having it. a baby, isn't it? You know. <laughs> well, you, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm always careful to say, you know, the people talk about pain and it's like, you know, you can compare it to having a baby. And I'm like, I don't actually know legitimately how much pain, physical pain that is. So I have to be careful. The gestation period. Yeah. You know, it was right at the end, nine, <laughs> 10 months. There you go. You've got a, you know, a healthy, a healthy book. <laughs> a, healthy, uh, a healthy book. Your book's in a really big size, right, Mr. Yeah. Fletcher. It's a dear boy. It's healthy. <laughs> <laughs> um so you're saying that you didn't get leslie west um that's a shame but was i mean it sounds like your hit rate was incredibly high was there anybody else that you're trying to get access to that you just couldn't uh in terms of getting access that that might suggest finding them i think i found almost everybody i was looking to find almost um it comes very high and it did at the time of the book i don't mind getting this out of the way it came very high on the list of questions at the time and it was cited in a lot of reviews yeah, did you get Pete? Did you get Roger? Did you get John? And the, the, the story with Pete was unfortunate, but I think history has been okay with it. I did get Pete and he was okay to do an interview and it got, uh, you know, just kicked down the line a bit. The Who kind of reformed around me right when I started this book. Uh, but, but really, yeah, they were great, like avid Who fans out there. They'll know that in 96, they got back together for the Quadrophenia show that was build as Pete Townsend sort of with Roger and John because he didn't want to reform the Who. And then that went well enough that he got talked into touring it. And it was when they were touring it, I was meant to fly. I have a feeling it was Cleveland because I rock and roll Cleveland. I yeah, had my it's final tap. It's final <laughs> tap. Yeah, yeah, the yes. home of rock and roll hall of fame. I have a feeling it was Cleveland. And I literally got up in the morning and there was a fax because we used faxes back then from uh, Pete's uh, assistant, who's a wonderful person saying, I'm really sorry, but uh, Pete's, um, Pete's called it off. And the reason that I was given that he didn't, he didn't, I eventually got a letter out of him to explain it. And I don't mind, it doesn't bother me talking about this 25 years later, having just reformed the who he was very, he, he was, he, he'd been struggling again with his own sort of uh, alcohol. I think it was a period where he dropped off the, the permanent wagon and he was in a period of holding Keith kind of responsible for a lot of issues with the who in his own life. Mm. And he felt that he wasn't going to be able to talk nicely about Keith. So he preferred not to talk. I was okay with that ultimately, Joe, because there's so many Keith, uh, Pete Townsend interviews out there. Yeah. So many that I got every quote I needed. And I kind of, I didn't actually expect to get Roger um even though he's ended up optioning the book for the movie uh, which may or may not get made uh -huh. uh, you can come back around to that i got everybody else and that includes people that were vital that includes dougal butler his right hand man even though his book had been optioned for a movie it included any manner of musicians managers you know chris stamp bill kirbishly all manner of people around the who but the, the key interview and it was almost the very last interview for the book was kim his ex-wife and that made the book i do believe Oh, absolutely. This makes it that gives it that 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 um, yeah. real personal facet, you know, something that I would be interested in, as well as a woman, you know, the relationship that you had with uh, with Kim. Um, unexpectedly, was anybody ever able to offer you some really valuable insight where you went, oh, I've spoken to this person who seems like quite tenuous, but actually they've got something really useful. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, great. That's a really, really good question, because the answer is yes, multiple times over. And I can't <laughs> um, I'm going to see if I can think of one example. But I think just the obvious uh, the, the thing was that I decided I would go down that path. And if somebody said, I know of somebody else, I will follow up. And so I would get things like maybe I had tracked down. I'm going to have to give you kind of like um, uh, random examples that may not be real. But let's say I tracked down a member of one of his former bands, like the Beachcombers. I, I got all of the Beachcombers, which was great. I mean, and actually I spent an evening with two of two or three of them together and they really relived their memories. But an example may have been that they would have said, oh, Keith did come to us from another group, but I don't think he was in it for more than a week. You know, here's a phone number. 
and you call somebody and he says, oh, yeah, 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 I went to school with Keith, you know, and so you might, you might call them and they go, oh, I went to school with Keith, but I know somebody, or you might call somebody who says, oh, I went to school with Keith, but I didn't really know him, but I think, I think this other bloke knew him pretty well. Let me, let me, let me have a look. Let me have a look, you know, call out. Do we still have so-and-so's number? And then I'd put in another overseas call and somebody would pick up and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I was at school with Keith. What do you want to know? And I had a lot of, I had a lot of that. Um, I would write to somebody and, uh, you know, I wrote to a teacher. Somebody gave me the old headmaster's address. I wrote to him and I got a letter back pretty soon in spidery handwriting. He's, I remember Keith very, very well. You couldn't not remember Keith. You know, regard, like you knew he was going to go on to something. So, yeah, yeah, I, it, it's amazing. I think that that's the thing when somebody says, you know, oh, here's this person. And you go, well, nobody knows who that is. If you've got the time, it's probably worth following up with that person because you just never know. And also they may have never had the sunlight on them before and they've got a great story. And <laughs> that's also really important. Some they'll of open up. They're not wary, yeah. you know, they're just yeah. kind of like, oh, yeah, I know something. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how many how many times you've done these kind of interviews like this, Joe, but sometimes you do know when your celebrity is they've told the story so many times that the story could be false, but they, they would pass the lie detector test because they've now it's become this, you know, it's the story they tell. And that is very different from somebody who says, you know, I've got like one particular memory of Keith based on this, and I've never forgotten it. And also something else that's just important, any, anybody who's maybe ever thinking of writing something like this or, or making a film or something like this, I don't think, I don't think it was luck. I think I think it was all at the right time. The fact that the book came out 20 years after his death, in the immediate aftermath of his death, there's there's there's, there's no room to write it. There, there would have been, uh, you know, Dougal's book came out at some point, but you need time to settle mm -hmm. and you need people to be able to get back on with their lives, not not miss Keith so much or maybe not not miss Keith so much. Mm -hmm. and be able to develop their more mature perspectives on somebody like him. And I think that uh, at the point I went about this book was at the point that people were ready. And some people said to me, yeah, you know, I never wanted to talk about him before, but I'm, I'm, I'm ready to do so now. Perfect. And the, again, the biggest of those was Kim, who had never talked to anybody about her life with Keith. It would and have that. taken a long time for this to process. She, she wasn't probably yes. getting getting Thanks. over things, but just to, to process it, get it in perspective and find the words. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I actually like talking to people around the fringes because they go, mm. oh, you know, they've got all this, they've got some great stuff often. But then, yeah, like you say, wait for your time. If it's timely, that person might open up finally. Um, yeah. Favorite? It's difficult. Very, any favorite stories? Any things that you just went? It might constantly just going. Oh wow, wow, wow. Oh god. Well, do you mean? Because there, there's <laughs> two categories there. One is favorite stories about Keith. But the other one would be like favorite stories of doing the interviews. And I'm wondering which of those you mean. Mm, well, uh, what about favorite story about Keith? Favorite story about Keith. Well, there was one I, there, um, do you, and, and, and I am going to do this in terms of one that I found out as opposed to one that was already in the press that I just right. needed to confirm or not confirm. I, I think a really key interview, and at this point, I don't remember how I got to him, but it, it, it would have been through this process of you just start picking up the phone and everybody who says, call this person, you call them. There's a, a guy called Jerry Evans. He's no longer with us. Um, he may not have made it through much beyond the publication of the book. He was ill, but he gave me a fantastic interview. He was Keith Sage, went to uh, Secondary Modern with Keith, and uh, they were both both these boys were smart enough to have to have passed their 11 plus but they they didn't and he was a prospective drummer and when he left school he went straight to working in Shaftesbury avenue at a music shop and was soon made a manager down there and he was the straight guy to keith's yeah you know, keith was already keith moon and we, you, if you want to ask questions about that that's fine keith was the keith moon we know love and some people feared you know from day one and um, but he he was the straight guy to Keith and they hung out a lot together, probably just cemented by the love of the drums and the love of rock and roll. And, for example, when Keith got drumming lessons from Carlo Little, the drummer with the Savages, who was his only ever drum teacher, very important figure in British rock and roll history. 
And um, without him, I don't know what Keith would have been like. Keith uh, struck up a deal with Jerry, which is, you know, we'll go there. This is not my favorite story part, but I, I think it's worth saying. Keith was like, look, we'll go around to Carlos. I will do the, um, I will do the, uh, I'll do the lesson, and when I come out of the lesson, I'll we'll run back to your place. And I'll tell you everything I learned along the way, and um, and then you know I'll show you, and you give me like a third of the cost. And so Jerry actually agreed to that. And Jerry also sold very efficient. Keith. Yeah, and I think Jerry sold Keith his first drum drum kit as well. And uh, so so that that's the story there of Carlo, but. Jerry told a bunch of stories, some of which don't seem so funny in hindsight of, you know, of Keith. He was, Keith was not anti-Semitic. He thought it was funny to say things um, about, you know, and he dressed up in Nazi uniforms. But he also crossed the uh, West Germany, East Germany border uh, with handing over a copy of Spike Milligan, my part in Hitler's downfall instead of his passport. Um, that got them into trouble. So he, yeah, he was equal opportunities um, <laughs> <laughs> like that. The story, yeah. the story. He was a he was a, what we call a tea leaf. Was was Keith always whipping something off the shelf? And he stole some coffee beans, a pack of coffee somewhere around Baker Street, and they were coming out of Baker Street tube. And the way Jerry tells it, anybody who's done the Bakerloo line, Baker Street knows it's a deep, deep, deep underground. With that, oh, it used to have these old escalators, very steep, like Jerry says, like a ski slope. So they get to the top, and Jerry's got no idea Keith's about to do this. Keith opens his bag of coffee beans and pours them down the middle divide and there were lamps at that point as well down the middle divide so the beans start gathering pace gathering pace gathering pace and bouncing off bouncing off these lamps and by the time they hit the bottom where the rush hour commuters are are waiting to come up the stairs they are being like literally bombed with these coffee pellets and i'm sure you could put this in a movie and reenact it and, and probably amplify it a little bit with everybody sort of falling over and trying to be like well, who's somebody go get that person and keep <laughs> being at the top of the escalator just laughing away and i mean jerry had no idea he'd even got the coffee beans and uh, and jerry was like constantly like i'm amazed we didn't get arrested mm -hmm. um, and other pe other people from that period said you know keith would do stuff that nobody else would get away with and yeah. I, you know, at least one person when i was rereading said i'm i'm amazed we didn't get filled in at times really i, I yeah. just yeah because keith the, the, his way out of it the stories with, with jerry who like as you say is quite sort of upstanding and then he's got this lunatic who's just fainting and feigning that he's going to be sick on, on, on a, a packed tube or bus or whatever and nicking things all the time and all that yeah he was kind of going yeah this could be, be a problem uh, just to, this is timely actually there's a comment that seems to have come through uh and it says uh, and this is on youtube and it uh, says i am carlo little's daughter emma uh carlo's wife iris sends her best wishes thank you for your wonderful description of carlo who's playing in his influence on keith I really appreciate that. I just saw the message myself. Well, thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Emma. And uh, hello. Hello, Iris. And I, I, I am really glad that Carlo got his got his little place in history. And by the way, that is another example of um, I'm trying to think of the expression when a detective would do. I'm not saying I was a, I could be a detective, but is it like gum? What do you call it? Gum, gum shoes? Yeah, I put up like uh, if they don't mind me telling this story, but it's too 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 late now. I I understood that Carlo was going to be important, and I was told that uh, he wasn't playing drums anymore, and nobody quite had his phone number. But they said he does run a hamburger stand at, at Wembley Market on Sundays, so I went up to Wembley Market on a Sunday. I mean that was the, the, my sole purpose, and uh, the only part I yeah yeah is that I don't think he was thrilled that I saw him in that scenario because uh, you know that's fair enough. Um, but you know, I talked with him and he said, okay, you know, like I'll, I'll, I'll give you a call. And then we actually arranged and had a proper interview and I realized his importance and he is such an important figure. And, um, that was just one example of where I was like, you know what, it's going to take me what three hours to get to Wembley and back. Worst thing that happens is he's not there. And I'm, I'm really, really, really glad he was there that day. I, I hopefully somewhere down the line, somebody would have given me his phone number, but sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. Yeah. And you did that for sure. So we're talking about the stories and you, you might want to mention maybe an interview story mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's a favorite of yours as well. 
Yeah, I think that just has to be Oliver Reed. Now, I am going to write that one up very, very soon. Uh, many years back, I, I did a couple of interview transcripts and put them on, uh, on my old blog, on my old uh, my old website, which I've now taken down. And I'm among the, uh, man, many who are now like, but well, not like, but who are using Substack as a place to to host their their writing. And it feels more like having a website, but you've got people signed up. And it, that's a little bit, I, I, it's important to say it's a little bit because I just feel we give away too much content to the Zuckerbergs and Elon Musk's of this world and it's better to have some control of it and know, know where it's going and that people want to read it and we'll, we'll get the chance you're not down to algorithms. So I mention that because I would love people to sign up for that and, and be on board with my writing and have a connection and they can reach me that way. But in a couple of weeks, I'm going to get this story written and put it out there. But Oliver Reed, uh, one of the few people who I felt could match Keith, you know, pace for pace, drink for drink. And yeah. one of several really famous names, I don't know if you've experienced this, Joe, with interviewing people, when they get to a certain level of fame, they handle their own business. And because they're, they're comfortable, they know they're not getting knocked off their perch. So they, they do have a, um, a gatekeeper. And I have an odd feeling that this was, I went through an agent, and I literally also remember going to a library in London, looking up like, the book of theatrical agents and seeing if I could find agents for some of these people. But I found Oliver Reed's agent and I wrote the facts, uh, most likely not an email explaining what I was doing. And I got a phone call back saying, um, here's Oliver Reed's number. He's expecting your call. Uh, and and, he, and that, that agent also said, it's probably going to be his girlfriend who answers. And she was in the papers with him because she was definitely young enough to be his daughter. But uh, he, uh, they, they said he lives in Ireland. I mean, he'll just take it from there. But but Oliver's good. Just call him. So um, so I called. And sure enough, it was his daughter picked up. But I got I got to speak to Oliver. I think she put him on. And he said, well, how do you want to do this? I mean, we can do it by phone. Or if you want to come to Ireland, come to Ireland and, and we'll meet. And I talked it over with my uh, my wife at the time, and we, you know we had we, we were in England for six months. The idea of going to, to to Ireland and maybe making a little trip out of it seemed great. So we so I, more to the point, I thought Oliver Reed in person versus the phone for the cost of going to Ireland, this is worth doing. And uh, my God, was it worth doing? I mean. The first that first that when I showed up to, to, to interview him, um, I think I told somebody at the door of the place we were meeting, I'm going to save some of this for when I write it up. But I said, I'm here to meet Mr. Reed. And I said, Oh, you must be Mr. Fletcher. He's, yes, he sent us a message. He's going to be a bit late. He's taking a cow to the vet. <laughs> And this was legit. He was actually he lived in the countryside. He, uh, one of his neighbor's cows had gotten poorly. So he was driving the cow to the vet. Uh, he is, was somebody who insisted that you drank with him. And um, I guess it was, yeah, in that regard, it was fortunate I drank because I don't know what he would have done otherwise. Um, but he was very much like, you know, you got to sit here and do this with me. And we were in a public place and he was just Oliver Reed. He told story after story. And he got, I did tell my, my wife, I'm giving you the keys now to the rental car because I, I, I don't know what's going to happen. And uh, he was he was delightful. He loved Keith very, very dearly. But he was a hell of a person to me. And, you know, he passed away on a film film set, I think, at a bar in Malta, drinking his, trying to drink his crew under the table. So he was also the only person I met who said they could have imagined Keith at the age of 50. They could picture Keith at 50. Wow. Um, somebody actually in the comments is saying desperately, whereabouts in Ireland were you? All right. Oh, <laughs> gosh. I, I will have this info when I put up the story, but it begins with an M. And I, I'm pretty sure it begins with an M and I'm not confusing that with being a market town. But it was a market town in the middle of Ireland and it was a hotel. And I honestly thought we were going to be meeting. I don't mind saying this at like a, you know, a five star country hotel. One of these like, you know, you drive up to you know it's it's just a posh place and maybe it's where oliver conducts his meetings it it was the equivalent of what i know to be in the town beverly where i was born where you know the main hotel is is essentially just a a, a pub with rooms above it in the middle of town and so i was meeting oliver reed bang in the middle of this town uh oh gosh it's a pretty decent sized town in the middle of ireland it was not too far from cork because i know that we tagged on going to cork i know that for a fact that's where we decided to stay and uh uh 
I, I will find out the answer by the time I post that because I yeah, would want to. So I would want that detail in there. <laughs> check check uh, Substack. Keep sign up to to Tony's Substack, and you'll get the the alerts on that. It'll be finally town in Ireland revealed uh, <laughs> uh, moment. So yeah, that's great. I mean, you know. If, um, I live near to Andover, Trogs territory, and for me, Oliver mm. Reed is obviously had his Trogs Wild Thing moment as many as well as many other moments. So yeah, I would if he had been around, I would wanted to go and meet him as well to be um, you know be around him, experience Ollie, uh, and uh, yeah, it's a great. Some great characters are larger than life, and he's one of mm. the few people I met that I felt was on a certain level with with Keith. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, Oliver Reed did his show, Drunken TV interviews. He was pretty unapologetic, but he he loved Keith, and m just about everybody I met loved Keith, and they really did. One other uh, interview. So many of these people aren't with us, but Jeff Beck gave me an exceptional interview, and again, some of these were incredibly easy to get. It would be a fax, maybe an email, or po quite possibly a phone call, and then a call back saying, "Can you come in and meet?" Yeah, next week and Jeff Beck sort of sat down and said you know I only really have one story but it's a really important one and it was about a weekend he spent at Tara after Kim had left Keith and so he'd met Keith a couple of times well he had another story because of course it was the only moonlighting Keith ever really did was for Bex Bolero so he had that story I thought that's what we were going to mainly talk about because that's why I would have wanted to approach Jeff Beck because Jeff Beck, Jimmy Page, Keith Moon and uh, and, and John um uh i'm pretty sure it was john i've got a double check i think it was keith and john and um uh instead he had he was like yeah that's that and he talked to me about that but it was this story of spending a weekend at tara and he just went and essentially i didn't have to ask a question and he 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 just told me like 30 minutes worth of of this and it was one of these where he didn't have a lot of stories but he had this one and it was perfect. And all I had to do for the book was keep just chiseling words out and trying to compress it. And it was one of the only interviews that I, I kind of let him run two or three pages verbatim in the book because there was nothing I needed to say. So that was in terms of a quality wow. interview. And he was a lovely person. I admire Jeff a lot. And I'm, so, I'm really uh, you know, sorry that he's no longer with us. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's that sounds great. But you mentioned detective work, and you did do a bit of detective work around one particular scenario, which was Keith's twenty first birthday. Yes. You got to the bottom of it yeah. by talking to about, and you had a secret weapon witness as well, didn't you? That person who had never had the sunlight on them before. Uh, <laughs> the boy with the camera. Put, sorry. <laughs> the boy with, with the person, camera. What person with the camera? Yeah. Well, it's look. It's this simple. I said this last night. That there's certain things when people tell you these stories that if they it's not that if they sound too good to be true, they can't be because with Keith, they actually possibly could be. But this is more just to do with a certain degree of logic. If at his 21st birthday party, he drove a Lincoln convertible continental into a swimming pool, where's the photo? Uh, we did have cameras back in 1967. There were lots of them. There were enough of them that there were photographers at you know, the party. It was Keith's 21st and multiple people told me, including Peter Noon himself, that Keith uh, was deep back, like basically Herman's Hermits were the pop stars and it was a cake fight initially. It was just a good nature cake. There were lots of girls there from the show. The sheriff was there. It wasn't like an out of control. This is a more innocent time. It's not quite got into rock and roll debauchery yet. And um, Keith got uh, debagged because it was his birthday. And that's what you do with birthday boys, even when they're 21. And, and the bumps. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yes, yeah, all that kind. Of, yeah, it was that. It was that together. And he never wore underpants. So, like when they ripped off his trousers, it's like all the girls, all these teenage girls. Are, I think uh, he just got up and sort of ran off, tripped up, knocked his front tooth out, which explains the toothless grin he had later in life. In absolute agony, he gets carted off to the dentist. So he spends the entire evening there. He's actually late. He doesn't make the flight the next day. He has to catch another flight. Somebody has to stay behind. So. Keith never drove a car into the pool. He's out of the party. The rest of them, Herman's Hermits, I spoke to a couple of them. They, 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 they admit, they said, actually, what was really weird is Keith left. And then we, we had a riot and we went running through the hotel, ripping fire extinguishers off the walls. And we, we, it was just like ridiculous. And they all got hit with a big bill the next day. But 
if there was a car in the swimming pool, we would know about it. The press would have been down. It would have been in the papers. It would have been like local rock group destroys hotel swimming pool. It's the Holiday Inn, for God's sake. And they didn't get banned from Holiday Inns either. That's that's like, but that wasn't even detective work. That's actually sort of lazy journalism because I had this book, The best, uh, the Story of Tommy, because I was that big of a Who fan. And it's got Pete Townsend writing the lyrics for Tommy on Holiday Inn note paper all around America in 1968. And he's like got the date on there. And, and it's like Holiday Inn Cincinnati, Holiday Inn here. Mm, it was so, fine. <laughs> Some of these things just don't make sense. And uh, I, I do sometimes think people got it confused with a with a, a, a story that's much more in, in Keith's um, manner, which is years later when he's at Tara, so early 70s, and Dougal's with him. He gets in one of his like fits of alcoholic-induced depression and decides to commit suicide with a great flamboyance. That's it. I'm going to kill myself. And apparently with Keith, you're never quite sure if he meant it or not. So... He goes out, gets in his Rolls Royce, points it at a tree, you know, puts it in gear and promptly, and that it was accidental, he meant to drive into the tree, reverse his into his swimming into his pond, not his swimming pool, his pond. And uh, ultimately, like that, you know, the, the, apparently it's in very slow motion. It didn't even go backwards very quickly. Uh, and uh, so ultimately gets out and says, oh, I guess I'm not going to kill myself after all. And similar but at the same time him and Dougal between them went Rolls Royce in pond there is a photo opportunity and they went and got a camera took a picture and I just think people have mixed the two yeah. but I also have to say I real I tracked it down in it was not until 1971 or 72 Keith gave an amazing interview for Rolling Stone um, but god he could tell some porkies he just he just tells this story and maybe he believed it he starts with like the real party and the next, you know, he's dri he's driven the car into the swimming pool. And because it was Rolling Stone and who were at the peak of their commercial success in, in many ways, but, uh, it, that story became legend and nobody ever fact checked it really until I went off and fact checked it. <laughs> so that's all you that's what you've been doing. You've been fact checking all this yeah. time. It's great. Well, we didn't but have that on the British music papers, did we? Did you come up for that? We didn't have fact checkers. I was an editor of a, oh, of a magazine. I, just I was a sub editor, it. so uh, you know we the, didn't the, have sub editors. Oh, we used to dream <laughs> of sub editors. <laughs> there are, that we, you know, we had to make sure because of litigation, <laughs> we had to make sure that things were, were correct. You know, I've also come across some of those kind of stories as well. Yeah. Um, it's apparent from the very start of Keith's life that he's got these traits that are going to to shape what he does, shape who he is, and also possibly tragically shape shape his life. But I was talking recently to, I'm going to do a drop of clanger here. I was talking recently mm. to the esteemed drummer, Bill Bruford. Some people may have mm -hmm. heard of him. We weren't talking about Keith, but we were just talking about um, uh, people that, that uh, Bill had worked with. And he said the character of the person and the musicality cannot be separated. So um, this seems like it's the driver for Keith's style, doesn't it? It, it, it is. And I, I would agree with Bill on that. I think uh, our personalities should come out in whatever medium we choose in life. I mean, you, know, you might be a geography teacher. That might be what you're destined to be. Um, and if you are, then you'll make a great geography teacher. And Keith gave... Uh, he did actually give his share of interviews and sometimes he would be really honest. I mean, sometimes you just felt, oh my God, he's making up stories. But there was one where he said, I didn't find the drums. The drums found me. And I think, you know, there, there is something really genuine about that. Here's a kid who like, he tried out on the bugle and you know, a couple of other things and was in the military, the sea cadets. And drums just made sense. I think we have to acknowledge he was hyperactive. And uh, he, was the, he met all the definitions of hyperactivity. And I'm not saying that, that hyperactive kids should play drums, but... For Keith, the drums made sense. Now, having said that, I think Jerry Evans was with him when he sold him that first drum kit. And uh, Keith's dad actually signed the papers for it to put it on the HP higher purchase. And they got it driven over because Jerry lived in Wembley as well. They'd gone to school together and set it up in Keith's front room. And uh, Jerry said, yeah, and he sat down and, and started hitting the drums like a madman like nothing everything out of place out of time this would have been pre-lessons with with the great carlo little and uh so hitting the drums made sense for keith but he did need to find out how to hit them in time and once he found out 
you know, he became the greatest drummer. He became the greatest drummer. But yeah, his personality did come across. He had an untold amounts of energy. Eventually, that energy, you know, would would reach a, uh, you know, it, it would fall off a cliff at certain times. There's only one or two occasions it fell off the cliff on stage um, with The Who. But he had incredible energy, and he took that out on the drums. He had incredible personality, as all The Who did. And that came out on the drums as as well. And I, you know, I'd love us to uh, just at some point talk about the musicality of his drumming because it's underrated. But uh, yeah, his personality, it's Keith. You know it's Keith when you hear Keith, don't you? Yeah, and that's the thing, you know, you, yes, you, you, absolutely, you can hear him. You know his influences like surf drumming and so on and not and jazz and not being particularly well-trained, uh, you know, having a few lessons and then going, yeah, I can do it. I think it, there's a, a quote in the book from Jerry going, why don't you learn a paradiddle? And he's like, no, you know, he's <laughs> rebelling against the, things like that. I don't want to know, you know, so the rudiments. I just want to yeah. bash stuff. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it seemed like, uh, do you think he was aware that he was actually a good drummer? He seemed quite confident because though when he's in his earlier gigs, maybe even later, on turns up at shows he's playing with a the band then he just asks to play with the next band oh can i play some numbers with you <laughs> yeah and the beachcombers talk of how so the beachcombers were all several years older than keith and they were they were like had steady jobs and they kind of knew they weren't cut out to be one of these new bands they they, they build themselves initially as a shadow of the shadows um and keith got rid of that name the moment he joined them they had the greatest time with keith they loved him so so much and that was really his major apprenticeship and the reason i'm, I'm talking about them is there was a point at which keith uh and this is i think you know, it's got is it pre, it's got to be pre muhammad ali cassius clay i think I mean, maybe somebody can correct me online but he stenciled up on his drums i am the greatest and um he would like you know walk through an audio a hall as a little like 15 year old kid 16 year old kid as i am the greatest he knew once once he got good on the drums he knew that he had something he really 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 did well we've got a, co a comment here from rod rod says can tony talk about the joy that comes through in keith's playing yeah well that's a perfectly timed question isn't it i i really really can i, I and we we showed a clip last night that uh that uh, Jason then sort of like showed what Keith was doing drumming. And this might not seem the obvious example, but it's Young Man Blues from uh, Tanglewood. It was from the Tanglewood concert that's available online. And uh, it's the interaction that Pete and Keith have with each other and they that their love for each other ran very, very deep. Keith idolized Pete, just idolized him. Uh, was basically a who fan in that regard and so so it's you know they've they've got it's the whole you know well young man ain't got nothing in the world these days and keith you know and then there's that little bit where keith and pete have to hit the note together and they're they're, they're next to each other you know pete's come over to keith and they're having so much fun predicting this note and you can see Pete at one point he's like holding off holding off and then he just suddenly jumps in the air and as he lands you know Keith hits the drums perfect second and they're like laughing with each other and I think that that's that's just one good example that comes to mind but uh there are uh there are so many clips some of them some of them where you can see Keith's working really really hard but I think there are some clips that may involve a bit of lip syncing and if you will look at Rock and Roll Circus is a great example where I think that that's my favorite moment doing the quick one yeah yeah, yeah. he is <laughs> um he like they start with the because I th I feel like that part I've, I've still never quite worked out what went on with the recording on that because I feel like that opening part there's no microphone where they're doing the four part a cappella, but Keith's at the back there singing along with his like lovely smile. Her man's been gone, I've an eye on a year, and he is just you know in heaven. Same as with the Tommy, can you hear me clip that's in the kids are all right. But uh, that joy, if I just go back because of you know, certain clips that are fresh in my mind, that same young man blues on about his first roll around the kit, he tosses a stick in, in the air, goes to catch it, and he just falls behind him. And, and fortunately, the camera's on him. And he just gives this like, like that. Of course, he's got a spare one here. And the audience last night laughed at it because you can see Keith's having fun. He's like, watch me show off. Whoops, didn't catch the drum stick. Still, I've got that little part where Roger's going, you know, well, you know, nowadays, he's like, I've got plenty of time to pick up another stick. No problem. And there's so much. There's a lot where you see him with his head down, really working hard, athletic. But, yeah, various clips you see him on Bellboy 
or something, his theme song. The, the guy loved playing with The Who. He loved being on stage. He loved playing live. He was never happier than doing that. But I'm not sure much happier than being in the recording studio. Absolutely. And the thing is, look, for some people, uh, and maybe for members of the Who at some of us that might have been thinking, he's leading from the back, he's, he's uh, attention grabbing, but he's actually adding such valuable playing and performance style. Think like abandoning the hi hat and just doing stuff over here, you know, like the stuff he's doing and playing with the, the you know, other symbols and God knows what else. He's adding such valuable performance to the rock and roll canon. And it goes on to influence so many people, diverse people from Clem Burke, very obviously. Obviously, <laughs> to Chris Cutler from Henry Cowell, one of his fa favourite uh, uh, rock drummers. And then, of course, Animal from the Muppets. He, you know, and Dave Grohl, big influence. I think he set his uh, symbols up at the same level to be like Keith Moon. Even on. Oh, um, I didn't know that. That's on, the, on the Top of the Pops appearance for Smells Like Teen Spirit, when uh, Kurt's singing along uh, like Morrissey and they're miming um dave is miming along with those pointy stick things like keith right. used to do right. you know mucking about kind of thing so he's he's really you know it, it looks like showing off it looks like attention seeking he was an attention seeker but there's substance there isn't there oh there's wonderful substance and roger uh has always given keith credit for emoting playing to the words and and if we're going to just you know use this part of the this conversation to talk about his playing style, I mean a I I I'm absolutely adamant. Um, there's pre there's pre Keith in rock music and post Keith. He's a watershed moment. Um, I, I would challenge anybody to you know over that. And and it's pretty it's pretty straightforward. Listen, I admire Ringo Starr a lot. I admire Charlie Watts a lot. Anybody else you care to name, but you hear their records pre can't explain anyway, anyhow, anywhere, and then you listen to what came afterwards, and and you know you could run this through probably AI and say you know what's what's the what's the fulcrum here, of how and it would, it, the, the middle of it would be Keith Moon, it, you know, and so I don't care if people want to talk about whether John Bonham was better. A, I don't think he was, and he played. Uh, like like terminally endless solos which keith did not do keith didn't solo um and i you, you know you can argue about technically better drummers but the point is keith was first he's the one who took the drums from literally you know kind of from the back of the stage there are who concerts where he's alongside them um on stage and at, at the peak period he made the drums a front line instrument about part of what he did and how he did that it wasn't just that he loved surf music and the wild drumming and that he'd been brought up on big band jazz drummers rather than rock and roll drummers it was that he played to the words and that is the, the genius of keith he's not playing to the bass he's not holding the backbeat yeah pete's got the weird job of actually being the rhythm in the band because because keith and, and john are doing so much different stuff but what Keith's largely doing is playing to the words and he's emoting the words and he does it on can't explain like literally on the first who single <clears throat> when you get to the chorus and there's the, the, the little triple you know kind of um da -na -na -dan -da -dan -da 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 -da. and to me that's like that 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 first chorus it's this announcement of like the drums are going to do something different now and obviously only one single later, anywhere, anyhow, anywhere, the drums are off the charts in terms of what was allowed. So is the guitar, admittedly. I mean, so, you know, the feedback, it's that record is astonishing for 65, let alone that it made the British top 10, um, is, is utterly, utterly remarkable. I have a feeling that's not exactly the answer for the question that you gave me, but I think <laughs> the question was about Keith playing. Uh, Substance about... and pioneering, basically. Yeah. So that, yeah. that's what we're talking about. Okay, so a little bit of time goes on. Unfortunately, it's it's sort of time squishes, but for Keith, he's caught up in the lifestyle now and he's caught up in the, you know, the, the excess. He's maybe not feeling actually quite as fit and energetic as he was when he was a young lad on whatever he was on, as well as natural enthusiasm. Um and do you think at that point, the lifestyle of being outrageous takes more precedence, being moon the loon? He mutates. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we're, we're compressing time here as well. And it's yeah. more fun to talk about the, the happy Keith and the up Keith. Uh, I, one of, one of the, the, the difficulties, uh, one of the negatives in some ways of doing, doing the book was learning that his problems started earlier than I realized. Um, he, I mean, on Tommy, he is brilliant. 
but even somewhere around that period people were having concerns and you know slow down and Keith didn't have a lot of people sort of said Keith didn't have a kind of gear that would slow down he was just always in high gear um you know a pill popping teenage kid a handsome little mod we've got to take into account that uh, he got Kim pregnant and he told his sister he told Keith, Keith told his own sister that he didn't marry her because he got her pregnant he got her pregnant so he could marry her which I find fascinating he, he had a sense of ownership with Kim and I guess one way your own person a, a person is being father to to their kid and <clears throat> so he's a parent at 19 and uh he's not a good parent not not surprising he's keith moon and he's carrying a lot of stuff and in the early 70s living at tara it's insanity and this is the stuff that we love because there's so many hilarious pictures and so many good memories and so many people have so many good memories of keith but most people were popping in and out of his life and, and unless you were dougal or kim you weren't living that life on a on a regular basis and for kim who suffered physically abuse at, uh, at, at, at Keith's hands, uh, it got to be too much and she left him and she went to, a, uh, 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 she, uh, she, le she left him and she ultimately married very happily Ian McLagan. And huh. I think those two were probably really meant to be together. They're both sadly no longer with us, but I believe they were probably meant to be together. And uh, Keith never really got over. Two things in his life he never got over. One was that Kim left him and wouldn't come back. And the other one was that Keith uh, was held responsible and held himself responsible for the death of his own driver, Neil Boland, uh, which took place as early as like early 1970. And although Keith got off at court because there were mitigating circumstances, uh, Neil, Neil was attacked by a gang outside a disco that Keith opened and uh, Neil was kicked under the car and somewhere in the confusion, somebody let the handbrake off the car to try and escape and <clears throat> Neil, Neil was crushed, Neil's head was crushed and Keith had to live with the knowledge that his actions, whoever was behind the wheel and Keith took responsibility for being behind the wheel, that his actions caused the death of his own security guy. And in his darker moments, he would you know, admit to that. And, and so he starts drowning himself and drugging mm. himself into oblivion between Kim and Neil. This is not a happy character anymore. Really, all he's got is the who and his reputation and the, the joy he can have when he's up. Because, you know, people who are like this, I'm, I'm sure a lot of us have been around people like this, these larger than life characters, maybe manic depressives, that when they're up, they are enormous fun to be with. But you don't tend to be there when the party's over. You know, yeah that's and part of it. so the thing is that you know very confident in some ways outgoing outrageous but then hopelessly vulnerable at times and that came out in his friendships and relationships and but yeah kim went through hell with him but even she said that um you know he, he you know how funny and charming and kind he could be and that he illuminated people's life he was a star and he illuminated people's lives so another side of of keith moon yeah, really. And uh, God, Kim was such a wonderful uh, interviewee. She, um, you know, I had been tracked, I had been calling her from very early on, I got her number very early on. And I would have been calling from the States to, you know, to the States at that point before that six months in England. And I just kept getting the answering machine. And uh, I guess I felt I needed to persist. And I would just leave a message every couple of months and say, you know, I, I, I can't give up on this. These are the other people I've spoken to. These are the other people. So I'd leave her a list. And I was back in the States after that six months. I was about ready to write the book, you know, regardless. About done with all my interviews. And I called her. And I, I don't know if I thought it was my last time, but it must have felt like. And she picked up. She picked up like the moment she heard my voice on the, on the answering machine. She literally picked up and said, hi, Tony, it's Kim. Yeah, I'll talk to you. And she'd been tracking me. And it sort of turned out that she'd been keeping tabs with people. So my, my leaving information, like I've talked to so-and-so and so-and-so, and so, she was checking that my own, my intentions were honorable. So oh. she said, okay, you know, I'll talk, can you come down to Austin? So I did go down and went and, and uh, went over to her house with, with, with Mac. And we had a, we talked so much and we got only halfway through that they said, look, do you think you can change your flight? And if you can, you can stay with us tonight at our house and we'll carry on doing the interview. And I was able to change my flight. 
and so that was uh, that that was uh, incredibly integral and she did love him dearly and I'm I can't put myself in the perspective or position of the abused wife she did you know there were patterns of her returning to him at times um but some of those patterns are ones we we always do read about that when somebody is nice they're very nice they're always trying to make it up to you and you always just hope they've turned the corner turned the page and oh. you find out they haven't and ultimately you realize that they're, they're not going to turn that page so you touched on this actually with him self-medicating to put it lightly do you think that um his death um could have been a suicide oh yep yeah. so th this has been coming up and i really relish the, the opportunity to talk about this I, I'm not going to pretend I know Keith, you know, better than anybody, but I did write the book and I, I was everything from talking to Annette, his girlfriend is uh, possibly his fiance, though the, the, any engagement was never actually announced. And I went to Sweden to interview her. I mean, I, I put a lot of my own money into, into researching this book and, um, I see no reason that Keith wanted to end his life that night. None. Uh, looking at the last interview he gave on Good Morning America, he's talking about the future very, very brightly, even as that's the same interview where he is asked what he's like um, during, like, what do you like, Keith? And he's like, drunk most of the time, very ill. But then he's promoting the album. He's talking about all the great, he's talking about the two movies they've got coming out. I honestly think that what happened that night was a combination of of a, a, a perfect storm and a big element of that i've mentioned dougal a couple of times um because dougal here's what i you know, what i say keith never died on dougal's watch and he could have done several times over and dougal was just genuinely cared enough for keith and we have these these people who are able to party but they've also you know they're keeping the pills the pills are in their pocket and, and Dougal always knew how much to let Keith have. And uh, yeah, of course, they got into incredible trouble and some hilarity. And Keith had a habit of ODing when he was with people. And he did it as far as I understand. And I recognize I'm sort of you know, projecting my thoughts. But again, I've done the research and people said as much. He would do it around people because he knew his life would be saved. So he knew that he was going to wake up in hospital with his stomach being pumped. But what that meant is that people cared enough for him. They were validating him. He was loved because at the end of the day, at the bottom of all this, Keith was this unbelievably insecure little kid from Wembley who couldn't quite believe he'd become one of the biggest rock and roll stars on the planet. He probably had what these days, you know, there's a name for it, right? Imposter syndrome. Probably, you know, there's probably a lot of that going on. I've never even made that connection before, but I think you would use that term now. He, when he took that number of pills on the last night, he'd been out at the Buddy Holly Story movie premiere. It was a difficult night, punk rock had happened, but he's sitting with Paul, McCart Paul McCartney and all the all the, that, you know, he's part of the aristocracy. The Who's new album is out, it's doing great, but they're not touring. They're not touring because Pete's not touring to protect Keith but Keith might have been happier to be on the road. There's a lot of stuff going on. He came home, he did his usual thing. He, he demands Annette cooks him a steak and he watches his favorite horror movie. And then they get in an argument and then he, say, he says something mean to her in bed and then he falls asleep and he's snoring. And Annette's been through this before and she just goes next door to sleep on the couch. You know, just same way that Kim had been through things before. And I think that Keith prob probably, listen, I, you know, nobody will ever know. I think he probably had a vague idea that he'd taken too many of these pills. He may have, he may have gone, oh, these are the pills to help me with alcohol withdrawal. I don't want to drink tonight. I know this is like a really important evening where I've got to, I need to show the band. I need to show everybody that I can be sober. So I'll take six pills before I go out because aren't they the pills? Yeah, that's not what they're for. They're not, then, you know, that's not what they're for. He should never have been administered, given these pills and never, ever, ever been given these pills. They should have been administered in like a hospital. Uh, and had they been given out when Dougal was with Keith, Dougal would have definitely held on to the pills. And so I think it was just this awful combination of everything, taking too many, forgetting how many, perhaps wanting to OD so that Annette, would get him to hospital and it would be like, see, everybody loves me. Everybody loves me. 
because probably that night before he's wondering about you know where rock's headed where his place in all of it is and then he's ends up his fiance sleeps on the couch so if there is a moment where she could have done something she's asleep next door yeah i think he was getting used to being the cat with nine lives that, that's, that's yeah, there's the, that there's yeah. that and we all talk about uh the irony i certainly do the irony that the drug that killed him was a drug meant to uh help with alcohol withdrawal but it was still a drug at yeah. the end of the day it was still a drug he didn't take too many vitamin c pills you know what mm. i mean he took too many him and everin yeah well we we were going to go up to eight o'clock we're allowed to do about another 10 minutes we've got a few questions here i don't know if they're all from the same person um <laughs> but uh uh there's a question have you ever received any feedback from pete or roger um yes now uh, from pete all good um def definitely um pete actually i'm pretty sure it was chris charlesworth he told soon after he was like oh man i should have should have been interviewed for the book i should have yeah, i should have done the interview i would understand uh, him being nervous about my intent i mean it was it was strange because the band were only just reforming there was no ownership so i mean i went to the who's office to interview bill and Bill was like, I can't really vouch for anybody else. You know, just keep trying. Just, yeah. And then uh, other people would say, no, yeah, nobody in the Who can tell me not to talk to you. I interviewed John. Um, I also met, I've also met Pete a couple of times since, and it's, it's, it, it's all been cool. I think Pete comes out of this perfectly well. It's all um, all right. <laughs> yeah. The kids are all it's right. All right. <laughs> um, with, with Roger, it is a bit more complicated. And I, there's stuff I, that, I, um, that, 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 that I, can't, I, I can't talk about in an interview. He didn't grant me an interview for the book, but the book is optioned for the movie. And um, so if he had any doubts, you know, those doubts have, have gone. The book is optioned for the movie. Uh, uh, Roger gave a TV interview not too long ago. A bunch of people like screen, quickly screenshot it, like literally took a picture of their TV and sent it to me. He had uh, the, the book prominently behind him. So I can only assume that he does, he does think highly of it. It, it. it is part of whatever movie may or may not get made. This might uh, also be a way of him dealing with what happens to remove himself a, a bit and then make a new story about yeah. it and I, I want to say the reason i thought i wouldn't get R roger my, my admiration for roger is 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 utterly enormous i know um, well let me let me let me leave that there it is i loved all of the who as a band it was it was yeah. a band i had a sense because but one reason i didn't start the book earlier was because there was a movie being made and there was talk with mel gibson and somebody close enough to the who just said to me i wouldn't let like the talk of roger making a movie stop you from doing the book because I don't know where the movie's at. And here we are about 30 years later. So that was whoever told me that. I'm very grateful to them because I decided to act to act on that. Um, I, I just had a feeling at the time Roger might be a bit proprietor about what I'm doing the movie. And that was that was what came back to me. And I was like, you know what, I'll, I'll live with that. That's OK. But I'm really glad that the book's then been optioned and that he must, you know, he, everybody approves enough that they're using it if the movie ever you know, does see the light of day. Very good. Um... Somebody else asked here, did writing the book change your opinion of Keith as a drummer? Oh, as a drummer, um, probably only improved it, actually. I mean, if I went into this book um, thinking that Keith was the greatest drummer ever, I came out of it knowing that he was. <laughs> um, no, as, as a drummer, I think it, I, I think my opinion only improved. And the more I listen, the more I feel like Keith, Keith's instinct, his musicality, uh, his, it, and I think you hear it at its best on Tommy. He is, he is, he, to me, he's the, the symphony orchestra in Tommy. You know, they never got the orchestra that they were meant to get. They ran out of time and money. Um, when I listen to something like Underture, about, and how, you know, I just think what Keith's doing is, is that's, it's good enough to get him in the, the LSO, as far as I'm concerned. You know, I love it. I love it also when, uh, you know, like they've, they've got previous with this, with not being able to afford cellos and singing cellos, cellos, cellos anyway. And he's even doing yeah. <laughs> I mean, the humour of the Who around that mid 60s period is just wonderful. <laughs> like some of my favourite songs are just ridiculous songs like Tattoo and yeah. you know, Marianne with the shaky hand, all that stuff around the Who. All from the Who sell out as well. Yeah, you know? well, I'm a boy. I mean, yeah, yeah, actually, I'm a boy lyrically is 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 fine. It'll just like kill a song after kill a song. Yeah. We've got the the film is uh, lighting people's imaginations, actually. Yeah, so, sure. uh, yeah. So uh, there's a question here. Movie about Keith. How do you see it? Does it show all the years in his life or a certain time? That's a big question, really, because it could be a series. I think it's if you do Keith, it's a series. <laughs> Yeah, well, here's, here's going to be my, my, my answer to this. You know, the movie is out of my hands. I, I made um, 
uh, I'm, I'm sure for me was the right decision many, many years ago that uh, I wasn't going to write scripts. I mean, maybe because nobody ever offered me. <laughs> I'm sure apparently you do get paid a lot of money for them. So but I just, I have a, I have a, I have a, uh, a, 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 an attitude that my job is to write a book and what somebody does with that book sort of after it comes out some of that's going to be out of my hands it's not out of my hands about getting it optioned and i chose to, to you know for that to go to uh, to roger but i i um uh, i don't have a say in the movie that would that would come out i'm not you know i i there are various like uh, parameters where i could be involved but i'm not being asked to write a script or to you know give the concept for the movie and i think one has to just be comfortable with that i've written uh, you know i've written um other books uh, particularly my memoir that people said my god that's a movie that's a movie it's a movie and i'm like yeah i agree i wish somebody would come along and just say i read this book i think it will make a great movie just because putting that I, out there <laughs> yeah just putting it out there yeah <laughs> Just putting it out there. We, we did the same with uh, David Hepworth and Mark Ellen on their great video show. Nobody nobody made the call. But people say to me, yes, it would be such a good movie. I say, I know, but I don't do movies. That's not who I am. I, I don't think that's my my role. Um, I don't mind like, you know, a little bit of guessing who could play Keith. We've run through some people. Mike Myers was going to play Keith. Then uh, Jonathan Schwartzman was going to play oh. Keith. And was up and, he, and he's, he's a drummer as well isn't he yeah he is a yeah. drummer yeah. yeah and what am i seeing here who's the uh someone saying the sam rockwell um yeah yeah would love a keith pit by pick based on tony's book with sam rockwell to, to play. Right. do i do i hear show my utter complete being out of it old man's letters sam rockwell oh uh, well if you've seen the modern hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy oh, okay. he's in, yeah he's been in a bunch of stuff he is uh he has a mania and a kind of energy okay. about him he's and he's also quite co comedic and this, this leads on to something else that another another questioner has said if roger ever got the movie made would it be a comedy or a drama right. i don't know no, you know keith moon no, on the but, tour buses i don't know <laughs> there's no there's no doubt that uh roger wants to, a, a movie to uh show the to be serious uh, I don't mean not to have its funny moments, but here I've got no problem. I mean, I'm just, it's just look at any interview with Roger about the movie. If if um, if it's taken a long time to get made, it's because Roger's, uh, there's, uh, I am quoting here from what I have read. It's not like I have particular inside information. It's just that uh, Roger doesn't want a script that makes too light of Keith's life or his antics. That's what I understand. You know, if Roger ends up like, like hearing this, that that's, that's my understanding is that he feels, you know, some of the scripts have been sensationalist. And that was the balance. I mean, as you can tell, I'm uncomfortable a bit talking about the movie, but that was the balance I had to strike with the book. Keith did do all these things. I mean, he didn't drive the car into the pool, but, but he did do some pretty funny and some pretty wild things. And some of them weren't so funny later in life. They just got a little bit boorish, but he did all those things. He was the most amazing character, but he was also the greatest drummer ever. And so, you know, you just have to find that balance. I'd like to believe I found it with the book, but, um, you know, I watched a couple of TV shows over the last couple of weeks, including ones that I was on, and, you know, they're sensationalists. I was watching that one the last 24, you know, last 24 hours, final 24. I'd agreed to be on that, and not surprisingly, it's a horrible ticking clock, sort of ticking yeah. downwards. Keith's got 13 hours to live. And I was like, oh, man, I wish I hadn't taken part in this. Um, yeah. Again, it's like I can control what goes on the printed page. And beyond that, I'm just another Who fan sort of really saying, oh, Sam Rockwell, Jason Schwartzman, you know, one that, one that who could direct it, you know? Oh, yeah. Mike Myers is probably too old now, but whatever. <laughs> I mean, since it's been brought up, I've been running through sort of like potentials in my brain, but I'm not going to go through them now. But it's, I think, wow, I mean, if you want an amazing story, and talking of amazing stories, the book is an amazing story. It has had a very long life. It carried on selling post any uh, anniversaries or, you know, sort of flashpoints where people were talking about Keith. How, do you know how many you've actually sold to date and across the globe and beyond? Yeah, I mean, approximately, um, approximately, it would be getting up to about a quarter of a million, which for a, a, a for for a rock book is is a lot. It's it's a lot. Um, it probably would have gotten translated into a lot more languages if it wasn't so bloody long. <laughs> 
But you know what? Talking about the book's long shelf life, the book had been out about 15 years and the Germans turned around of all languages. The Germans turned around. I don't mean the Germans, but the, a German pu publisher. Keith, Keith would love that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm thinking it's very Keith. I, I suddenly got like, oh, uh, we've got an offer here from from Germany. Yeah, they want to translate the book. Um, yeah, you know, which is basically yeah, go for it. And they managed to add another hundred pages, and I didn't write an extra word. <laughs> like, yeah. Wow. Well, it's the German language. Every word like has twice, you know, as an as an extra syllable. In oh, it. it'll all be joined up as well with lots of them. That's yeah. There's uh, the, the the cover is uh, somewhere like on my uh, on my regular uh, my regular website. Uh, yeah it's pretty it's pretty funny it got to, it, it, and only literally only two three years ago it uh got got published in brazil with a portuguese you know language and it's the second of my books uh the smith's book had the, had the same treatment which was great and the the, the brazilians with that actually without my knowledge but it's very cool they they put together a limited edition of all these little cutout figures and you can get this little cutout what? Keith Moon. Oh, I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's all very, very, very cool. And they sent me like two or three of those and a few more like other copies I haven't opened because they're in Portuguese. And I can barely do Spanish. Um, it's never gone off the bookshelves, but the fact that like the book will be 20 years old and then and then you know the, the agent will just get in touch out of the blue and go, Yeah, they, they want to publish it in Brazil. Um, they want to publish it in Germany. I think France was the other country and it's sold phenomenally well in the in the uk um i know it's right up there as omnibus's best-selling book and I, I a lot of it I, I again always 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 credit to chris charlesworth for his support i i've got to credit my editor in the states as well tom dupree one one quick thing because i rereading the book i don't mind that we're going a little bit over at my end rereading the book um I'm, i was aware at the time that i i wrote sort of um what's what's the word almost conversationally at times and i sort of half not invented scenarios but i might put myself in perspective like you know keith uh keith wasn't going to stand for that no way no how you know up he jumped straight at this person that kind of thing and uh obviously i'm not inside his head at, like literally but I was kind of living inside his head and I, I, I wrote like that and I was thinking, God, this is pretty risky. And the book was meant to be handed in in the summer of 97. And uh, we had a trip book back to the UK, you know, the usual book you tour before you finish the album. And there was no way it was getting done. I'd written my call of uh, written my 100,000 or 150,000 words. The problem was I was up to 1974. So I had to tell Chris and Tom, look, I've got this trip book back to Brittany and we got the baby and and they, they said, look, look, we we know how much you've been working. Send us what you got and let us have a look while you're away. And uh, you know, hopefully all's good and then you can finish it when you get back. I think we're gonna be okay. And uh Chris got back to me within twenty four hours. I must by that point have been able to email it to him. Uh, I may have hand delivered it to him actually in London. It's quite possible. Got back and he was just like so effusive. He was just like, "Oh my God!" Just when you don't worry about it. When you get back to the states, just carry on. And I was a little more worried about the American publishers, and they said the same thing. They were like, "We just love it. We love that you put your thoughts in there." That more, 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 more. More, more, more. <laughs> and I don't know. A, I, I, I think I've had a lot of that confidence kicked out of me by subsequent editors, it's a kind of ironic, but you go to work with sort of, you know, in some ways better, I quote, bigger, you can get away with bigger, longer standing publishing companies, you know, Oxford University Press or WW Norton, really, really, really established companies, but they will expect you to, to write more formally. And, you know, that's a part of what you have to accept to work with them. And so I've had some of that beaten out of me now. I don't think I could write like that again. But I also don't know if the editors exist who would encourage people to, to when you hand in 150,000 words and say, sorry, I'll, I'll hand this book in a few months late. I'm having a holiday, but here's what I've got. You only asked for 100,000. And they're like, just give us, give us it all. Just this is great. Well, that, there was barely a change made in the copy. Fact checking. Yes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, there's nobody could fact check with that much because I don't really mean that. I mean proofreading, copy editing. They had to trust me. I I'd done my interviews. They knew I'd done the interviews and done the what do we call it? Gum work, gum shoes. Yeah, yeah. gum shoe. Gum shoe. <laughs> detective work. Absolutely. Yeah. You've been this. You'd been a sleuth for 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 so long. Well, um, it has. It's had an incredible uh, impact. Um, 
you know, many people saying, friends of mine and people online saying that it's one of the best, if not the best biography, like music biography they've read. One friend of mine even said it changed their, their life. So, you know, in, in really, really what, so well, well done, uh, Tony. I don't know if there was a, a, you know, why the next book you wrote was called Hedonism. Well, maybe you fed <laughs> but, um, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of funny <laughs> things out there. I've started making music again with my best mate. Uh, who was in the band Apocalypse with me way back in the day, uh, in the early 80s. Uh, he was not one of my schoolmates. I actually got him in as my Roger to me being Pete because I, I didn't have a good enough singing voice and uh, needed somebody else to at least sing my songs. And we stayed best friends after leaving the band. And uh, we were trying to think of names for this new project. And it was his wife who said, you, know, you should just call yourselves the Dear Boys because that's what you are. So I was like, well, I kind of, yeah, you know, I don't own the words, but if anybody's going to call their band Dear, the, the Dear Boys, I, it should be me. Got to be you. Uh, Absolutely. There is a Californian band called Dear Boy that confuses matters, but there you, there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, and, it, and it's funny, my memoir was called Boy About Town. I wasn't trying to get the word boy into all of my life, but maybe I come across <laughs> well, the, the boy, as well. the boy done good. But just, I think, just as a final question, why do you think Keith and this story, you don't have to be a Who fan, you don't have to be a drummer, you know, you might be interested in the Who in the 60s and you might be interested in Keith. But why do you think it connects with people? Why does Keith connect with people? Yeah, and that's a, that's actually like a, a really good sort of final question. I I think we thought at the time there was the potential for this book. It's it's not, the expression is not, um, it's not jumping the shark, but it's where it makes a certain jump and from its core audience to a bigger audience. And it happened very, very quickly with this book. And I think it is because of Keith is so, ex there's a couple of things. I think it's because Keith was so extreme and you're not going to get a, a, a I'd say a better story, but the better is qualified, you know, a bigger and potentially, you know, yin yang, happy, sad story than Keith's. You want the wild man of rock, it's Keith Moon. Um, <clears throat> you want the tears of a clown, it's Keith Moon. You want the greatest drummer ever lived. It's Keith Moon. So you get all of those things. But I think there's something that I put right at the end of my introduction to the to the book that I saw in Keith the story of literally his generation. He was the youngest, one of the younger examples of that first rock generation that did change the world. And he was maybe one of the most out of control, un, untutored, unmanageable of those those characters that they were in uncharted territory. They were somewhere between pirates and Vikings that went off and sailed the far seas. And yeah, you know, maybe that only meant back then the, the USA, but they sailed the far seas and they kind of conquered the world. And there was no blueprint. There was no precedent for what went on with rock music in the sixties. No precedent, nobody, British working class kids had never been as rich as the rock stars eventually became once they finally got their contracts in order. And I think that the book captured that so that if you wanted a story with everything I just mentioned about Keith and the story of the rock generation all in one place, and hopefully a hell of a read and hopefully you know, a well written book, then this was this was the book and somehow very quickly in the UK, it made that transition and people started talking about it. Um, I've got one or two other examples in my life uh, where, where a book, I've seen a book, there's a running book called Born to Run that made a similar jump. It's an amazing book. And suddenly everybody was buying it. And I was you know, one of those people, but I'm a runner as well. But it was one of those books that it just made that made that jump. And I think those are the reasons. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. And there's another thing that's just personal to me is that, that having this cover and having Keith on the cover, this image, just this young lad, you look at him for me and I kind of go, what happened to that boy? You know, yeah. he was a boy yeah, um, was. and he, re he remained a boy. He's like a child. And you kind of think about the vulnerability of this boy who sort of reluctantly became adult, but was lo was lost, you know, and you want to know what, what, what in detail what happened there and in fact this, this is also symptomatic of how he could t turn this on you know look at this look yeah this is, well, he this is, for me person. this is antonio banderas's puss in boots when he's done something wrong and he's looking kind of very appealing <laughs> look at me you know kind of like oh you know uh, you know you really you, you, you know i can win you over very charming very sweet but very very vulnerable and i think it just comes out just in this this image as well yeah, so 
Yeah, brilliant stuff. Really, really, you know, it is an amazing, amazing read. Brilliant job. You know, you say it's not quite your life's work. I think it might have been, but you've done many, many more things since, Tony. Thank you so much for yeah. chatting to me and thank you to... Uh, to, it's time for us to f -f -f fade away now. Um, so thanks to Tony. Uh, thank you so much to Keith. Uh, yeah. And who, thanks to Omnibus. For, yeah, thanks, uh, Greg, for getting this together. It's been yeah. great. It's paying us at our end. So uh, <laughs> live, live streams uh, apparently do work. I'm glad, and thank I'm you glad so, to know. And thank you to so, so much to everybody who's tuned in and sent questions and, uh, you know, uh, lent an ear and hopefully enjoyed tonight. And uh, if you haven't read the book yet, do get it and if you have keep rereading it and there was an, an after more was added in 2005 so you know it's an evolving story and there'll be more on the sub stack as well <laughs> yeah there will be thank you so much joe that was great really enjoyed and that thank take you take care everybody take care. Thank see you. everybody cheers